Are you scared of blocking? With this handy tutorial, I'm going to take all of the guesswork out and show you how easy and quick blocking your hand knits can be. Hey there, Fiber Junkies! Welcome back to The Color Cauldron. I'm Johanna, the owner and dyer behind Potion Yarns and host of this podcast. And today we have a tutorial video for you. And this one is about a subject that gets a lot of questions for me on the podcast. And that is the big B word. Blocking! So, most of the things that we talk about in knitting, I feel like you either love it or you hate it, right? Like. Kitchener Stitch is one of those things. I personally love Kitchener Stitch. I think it's awesome and overrated and I can't, I mean underrated, and I can't understand why so many people hate it. I think it's amazing, but I know a lot of people hate it. However, blocking is one of those things that I don't think I have ever met someone who loves it. I have met a lot of people who don't mind it because they love the results. Most everybody loves the results most of the time. But blocking is one of those things that is just not fun. It slows down the excitement of casting off. You're so excited to be done with your project. You're so eager to wear it, put it on, give it away, whatever, but crap, I have to block it and weave in the ends, right? And then it really can be a tricky, tricky beast. So today I wanted to just show you one of the sweaters that I have had in my pile. I mentioned it on the podcast recently. We talked about um, some things that I needed to get blocked, get ends woven in, buttons sewn on, etc. And one of those was the Tongue Tied Sweater, which is a vintage inspired little blouse that I made by the amazing designer Amy Apple on Ravelry. So I am going to be showing you today how I block my tongue tied so that you guys can hear some little tips and tricks. What this video is not is an extensive question and answer time of all of the tips and tricks and everything and anything you might need to know. It's basically not an A to Z about blocking. It's just a little tutorial to get you started and show you in general how blocking should go. What this video is going to cover is one specific technique for blocking and that is wet blocking. It is probably the most common blocking form that people talk about um, or that knitters and crocheters mean when they talk about blocking. However, there are other types of blocking. Steam blocking is one of my personal favorites that I love to use, especially for small projects or just sections of a project that need to be blocked when the entire thing doesn't need to be, also when I'm in a big fat hurry. Um, there's also, um, there is a dry blocking technique, but I've actually never tried it, so we're not even gonna bother talking about that on here. We are not gonna be using blocking wires. I actually have never used blocking wires. And somebody asked me about that on um, my social media this week because I was talking about doing some videos on blocking. I am gonna do a lot more in-depth question and answers coming up, but you know, I have never used them. So I honestly don't have any information for you. I'm gonna look up some information, see if I can get you some tips and tricks to get started, but I've never used them. I want to, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. So what we're gonna do is show you very, very basic, easy, wet blocking style on my tongue tied sweater. The other thing that you need to know, um, there's a couple things you need to know first before we jump right into actual how to block your sweater. Don't worry, it's coming very soon. But the first thing you need to know, when you very first go to block something, anything at all that you have knit or crocheted, the very first thing you need to do is take a look at the ball band on your skein of yarn. So I hope you kept it or made a note of what was on there because you need to know the fiber content, okay? Blocking really works best on wool and animal fibers. It can be done on other fibers, cotton, silk, bamboo, nylon, acrylic, it can be done on those things, but there are limits to what can be done based on what type of fiber you are doing. One of the things that you don't want to try blocking is acrylic. Now I know I just said you can block it. Okay, technically you can wet it and lay it out and get the stitches kind of evened out if you're talking about that type of blocking. But if you're trying to stretch your acrylic project into a different shape, open up lace, get a sweater to, um, you know, kind of lengthen the sleeves a little or to like pull the body out and expand it a little bit. If you're actually trying to change the shape of your piece and open up stitches, acrylic isn't gonna do it. Um, it's just the properties of the fiber are not going to have the elasticity and the bounceability that uh, wool has and you definitely don't wanna be steam blocking acrylic because you can actually melt it and burn it. So this is going to be a specific wool, wet blocking technique for wool and wool blends and animal fibers. Um, silk is also one that you can block if it's 100% silk, it's not really great or advisable, but if it's a silk blend, go for it. Um, 
So today we will be focusing on that type of blocking. Just know that if you're trying to block acrylic and especially if you're trying to block lace acrylic or change the shape, you're gonna end up frustrated and it's just not gonna work. Okay, the other thing that you need to know is that um, water is very different based on where you are. And so when you're doing the wet block technique, I can tell you something that works for me. And in general, all of the tips I give in this video should work across the board wherever you are in the world. However, uh, one thing that you wanna be very careful with, whether you're working with indie dyed yarn or commercially dyed yarn, it's not just indie dyers, literally any type of yarn that is not bare undyed wool, you always, always, always want to wash a swatch first uh, because A, it'll give you ideas of how the um, yarn reacts when it's wet and how much you can block it. Also, B, you need to wash your swatch if you're doing anything that needs to fit like a sweater or something because it can change a lot when you block it. So I've had sweaters before that I did a swatch and it laid flat, like stockinette in the round or something, it laid flat. And I was like, oh, I don't need to block it because see, it's laying perfectly flat. I can easily see the stitches and measure it. But then I got my sweater done and it needed a little bit of blocking and I put it in and just lightly blocked it and suddenly my sweater grew two inches across the bust and now I have a big slouchy sweater when I wanted a nice fitted pullover, right? So you really, really do need to do it. Now I will admit, I don't follow the rules and I don't block all of my swatches all of the time. Some of that is because I know myself well enough and my gauge and my habits that if I'm working with a needle that I work with frequently and a yarn I've worked with before or at least a weight and fiber content I've worked with before, I know a lot of times, like on my socks, I don't swatch for socks ever, but I even if I have, I know in general like what my socks tend to come out, what size and shape they tend to come out, so I don't, worry about washing my swatch and all of that. Um, but the other main reason that you wanna wash your swatch in addition to just making sure you don't mess up your gauge and your sizing is that with any colored yarn at all, it will be a good indicator of whether your yarn and your water pH are compatible. And what that means is if uh, color is coming off in the dye bath, like you're getting bleeding yarn or something, you don't wanna put your bright red dyed yarn right next to your bright white yarn and then leave it to soak and blocking and you come back and it's all run into the white, right? So a swatch can kind of give you an idea of if that yarn is gonna bleed, how much, if it's gonna affect the white, etc. I always, always, always recommend using color catcher sheets in your um, wash water if you are at all concerned about color bleeding, even if you're not just maybe throw one in just to be on the safe side, but especially if you haven't washed your swatch yet and especially if you have multiple colors that are next to each other and you you don't want them to run in and obscure, okay? But we're gonna talk much, much, much more about bleeding and um, colors running and how to avoid that in an upcoming video, so stay tuned. Why don't you just hit that subscribe button right now while we're thinking about it. Make sure you tap the little bell so that you get all the new notifications, and that way you won't miss the new video that I have coming out very, very soon about yarn bleeding and how to avoid that. So let's go get blocking. Okay, so today we're going to practice this technique by blocking this little sweater that I made, the Tongue Tied Top by Amy Apple on Ravelry. I just want to lightly block this out to open up the lace yoke and to just kind of even out these stitches. So I've run some cool water. Um, you want it to be cool or cold water. Every time you're working with hand dyed yarn especially, which this is a hand dyed yarn that I got from Anzula Yarns, Every time you want to work with hand dyed yarn, you really want to work with cool or cold water because um, the more heat that you have, the more likely it is to cause uh, agitation and felting on the yarn. But also, even if you have super wash fabrics that aren't going to be affected by that, you don't want to use hot water on those hand dyes. Um, you want to use the cold water just to make sure that you're being as gentle as possible and not disturbing anything. So to my cool water bath, I have added a little bit of eucalyptus. This is what I use here at home. Um, there are several other ones. Soak is a really good one. Kangaroo wash, uh, there's unicorn wash. There's several other ones. All of these are wool washes, which means that they are a no rinse wash. I highly recommend this for your hand knit items, particularly if they are wool, because as it says, you don't have to rinse it. That means there's only one round of soaking this, rinsing it out, um, and then dry, before you get to the drying, as opposed to if you're using a regular um, laundry soap or like a a baby shampoo or something that's really gentle you're going to need to wash it and then do a rinse load it just wastes more water and it's harder on your yarn and it takes longer so you're going to submerge your um, item in your soapy water 
and you don't want to like rub it around because that can cause agitation but you do want to just make sure that it gets completely immersed in the water and then I'm just really gently um, squeezing with my hands a little bit really gently I'm not rubbing or anything I'm just kind of gently squeezing and allowing it to get fully immersed in that water now here's the trick with hand dyed yarns especially, although this can affect commercially dyed yarns as well. So really anytime you're working with a hand knit, you don't want to let it soak. And I know that the expectation is the longer I let it soak, the cleaner it gets, right? That's actually not true. These wool washes specifically are designed to work quickly and you don't need to let them soak because of the way that protein fibers in particular are. You don't really need to let it soak and actually if you let hand dyed yarn soak, depending on the pH of your water and stuff, that can release bleeding. I'm gonna be doing a video about bleeding yarns and crocking yarns very soon, so stay tuned for more information on that. But for now, just know that when you're blocking, you don't want to soak your hand knits or your yarn. You just wanna lightly swish it around, make sure it gets fully immersed in that water. If you have something on your hand knit, like let's say I'd, um, I was just washing this and maybe when I was knitting it, I got a little bit of something on there. Um, this is any time you'd wanna do any stain treatments or anything, or just very, very gently try to use the water and the soap to loosen up something that's on the outside, like if you get some ketchup or something on it. But in general, just for blocking, you have probably haven't worn it yet, so you don't actually need to let it soak very long, okay? Then we're gonna squeeze this out gently again. And then this is the fun part. Lay it out in a towel, and then you're gonna to start to roll your towel over your hand knit. Roll it up nice and good. Now this is a pretty small, short little sweater, so it doesn't take a lot of the towel. Once it's completely rolled up, you wanna really like put some weight on it. I even like to stamp on mine, stomp up and down on it. Make sure you get it completely rolled in the towel so you're not actually stomping on your sweater. Stomp up and down on it. If you have little kids at home, this is a really fun, good activity to get your kids involved and get those wiggles out and give them something to do. Um, you can have them stamp around on it. And then you're gonna proceed to the blocking. Okay, so now that we're ready to block, we're gonna lay out our sweater on blocking mats. Now I am using these interlocking mats that I got at Aldi and you can also get them on Amazon um, and Target and places like that, but they're basically just soft foam mats that you can stick a pin through, and they often have them for like little kids' rooms, and they come in these kind of puzzle shapes so that you can spread them out any which way you want. So, I'm just gonna use these on top of my dining room table or another flat surface, and I've laid out my sweater here after getting most of that moisture out with the towel. And you can see that already, even without pinning anything at all, the stitches are already laying flatter and more even, and I can really manipulate the fabric any which way I want. That is both exciting and a little terrifying because we don't want to stretch it out to the point where it loses all of its life and all of its elasticity. So the key here is that we're going to try and maintain the shape, but not pull it out too much. Now with this sweater in particular, the main part that I want to block, I really like the body and the way that it's laying, so I just want to lightly block this yoke that has the lace in it. So I'm going to take these T-pins. These are little blocking pins you can find at like fabric stores and stuff. I'll show you what it looks like. And these little silver pins are really great for um, blocking all kinds of hand knits. If you don't have those, you can just use regular straight sewing pins. I have some extras because I am missing some of my T-pins right now, but we'll start with the T-pins. And you're going to just basically insert your pins into points in the stitches to just kind of try and maintain that line. So the exact number doesn't really matter. Some people will use more, some people will use less. But what you do want to avoid is having peaks. Now what I mean by a peak is like, let's say right here, I want this to have a nice slope of the shoulder. I don't want it to have peaks. And what I mean by that is if I don't use enough pins, it'll start to pull away. You see that right there? How it's creating this little peak? That's gonna give me a real bumpy, uneven look. I don't want that. I want to make sure that I am keeping this nice sloped shape 
So I'm not stretching very hard, I'm just opening up these holes and then I am maintaining enough pins here where it keeps that nice slope. Okay, now I'm leaving the ribbing completely alone at the neckline because ribbing is one of those things that unless the pattern explicitly states it, you don't want to block ribbing. Now, the Lady Lally Brock mitts that I did on the podcast a few weeks ago, I showed those, and they have a ribbed cuff that flares out into a bell shape at the bottom of your um, wrist. And you did want to block that ribbing because you were trying to stretch it and get a more drapey flow. You didn't want it very tight and clingy. So for those ones, I did block the ribbing, but that was because the pattern explicitly stated and was designed in such a way that you wanted to um, increase the drape and get rid of some of that elasticity. But in this sweater, the elasticity is necessary to maintain that vintagey fit. Now I'm just very lightly pulling this down here to open these holes up. I don't want to open it up very far because I don't want it to stretch out and get too big. Okay, so now that we have everything all laid out, we're going to take our tape measure and we're going to just make sure that we didn't overstretch. One of the most important things that you want to do when you are blocking is you don't want to over block and stretch out your sweater. This is why it's so important to block your gauge swatch and to make sure that you block your garment the same way that you block your gauge swatch. So if you just very lightly stretch your gauge swatch, you'll only want to lightly stretch in the blocking because if you stretch too extreme, it'll stretch it out and then your sweater will be too big and you'll have a sweater that's a dress or a sweater that just hangs around your boobs or around your waist, right? So we're going to make sure that our underarm is matching where we need it to be. So after it's all pinned and laid out flat, oh, my tape measure is all kinky. So I am actually getting 36 would be my bust width and that's too big for me. So I'm gonna have to repin this because I don't want it to be that big. I want this, usually in a modern sweater, 36 would be great for my bust size because I'm about a 34 and a half, 34 and three quarters, something like that. So that would usually be great. The problem is with vintage sweaters and vintage styles like this, you don't actually want it to be that big. You want it to be um, much closer to your actual measurements or even negative ease so that it's not stretched out um, and it's very, very fitted when you wear it because hand it stretch a lot. So I'm just going to kind of like lightly push this back together and then we'll repin again. Okay, now that we have everything blocked out and we've triple checked our measurements and we're back to where we want it to be, right around that 34 inch bust mark is gonna be about perfect. We're just gonna go ahead and leave this alone because we need to let it dry now. Now, um, you may have noticed that I have only blocked around the lace yoke. I didn't put any pins in the body section. That's a personal preference. If you are worried um, about the body part coming out, you can always add to it. The reason I didn't do it on this one is because my stitches and my gauge were pretty even on the stockinette in the round body that I did. And I didn't want, again, I don't want to pull it out and overstretch it and make it grow and get bigger. I want it to be very elastic and stringy. So I kind of pushed that body back together after I measured the first time and found it was too big. I really pushed it back in and I just have made sure that it's all straight across here so there's no like puckering. Um, although honestly, even in this one, if a little bit of puckering occurs at the bottom like that, it's not a big deal because it's stocking it in the round. It's gonna lay flat when you're wearing it and you wanna maintain this ribbed um, cuff down here because you need that to be super stretchy. So you don't wanna stretch that out at all. So just go ahead and leave that. And then I've just made sure to lay, lay the sleeves flat, but not stretch them. And then they're not springing back on their own at all. They're staying exactly where I put them. So I'm not worried about them bunching up or, or losing their shape. The reason you use the pins is to keep things stretched while they're drying and so you wanna use it on lace or any area that you're trying to make it a little bigger or stretch it out or open up the stitches. But if it's laying just fine on its own, you don't need it. 
Okay, so since we're not going to get to all of the questions today and this is just a quick tutorial, feel free to leave me a comment below and let me know if there's anything else you'd like more information on. I will do my best to answer them or maybe someone else on this channel can answer them as well. If you have some experience blocking, feel free to uh, answer questions that you see or leave me some comments, leave me some educational uh, material because I'm always learning from you guys as well. And this is a fun journey for me that helps me expand my knowledge too. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that takes the fear out of blocking and gets you inspired to go finish up those hand knits and make them look really, really nice and professional. This is where we're gonna cast off. Love you.